second and thank Daniel for that. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, you could say exactly the same thing about the arts in general, music in particular. It's been such a joy um, watching Daniel practice and practice and practice and practice and practice in the Arts Center for the last few years. It's been a real inspiration for me, Daniel. Thank you. <clears throat> so when you stand up here, you want to use this time to sh share something personal, but not too personal, something fun, but not too fun, and definitely something worthy of your attention in this community. So in the build-up to speaking, I certainly tend to be reflective about my life, looking for something that I can share. And I do wonder if this is the way that my good friend, Mr. Chapman, lives his entire life. So this past weekend, I went to Maine to visit my father and help him drill 100 taps into maple trees. He and my Scottish, very not wicked stepmother live in an old farmhouse at the end of a two-mile road in what I like to call the real Maine. I grew up on this farm, but at an age of four, began going back and forth between my divorced parents. I started to put down some of my own roots where my mother lived outside of Washington, D.C., when in the sixth grade, my father wrote me a letter. He wrote that letter to encourage me to come back to Maine. He wrote of the opportunity to go to a small school, so small, in fact, that grades are often combined. There, I could be part of a community where nobody gets lost and where the kids in your classes all suit up in the afternoon to play for the school teams. Co-ed soccer, basketball, and co-ed baseball. That's what was on tap. Our town played against the other small towns in our little corner of the state, and those contests, believe it or not, were the highlight of the week in that small town. So I heeded my father's advice and guidance and moved to Maine for seventh and eighth grade. Looking back on it through a more seasoned eye, those two years were the closest I ever had to a Brooks School athletic experience. I started as right wing for the soccer team both years, and in the spring I played third base. I ran the scoreboard for the basketball team. Two things then happened in my life. One is that all the other boys grew, and I definitely did not. I entered high school around five feet tall and with a high-pitched voice. And let's just say I wasn't the athletic specimen you see up here today. You can laugh. OK. And the other is that I moved from that small town in Maine to a very large area in Northern Virginia to a public high school with nearly 3,000 students. I went from about 20 students per grade to about 600 overnight. And for those four years, while my body was catching up with the pack and school teams were, sort of seemed inaccessible to me, I struggled to find any athletic outlet. I tried soccer playing for a club. I tried running cross country. I tried some diving, which a lot of people said was really good for short people. And Dean, I even played a little bit of lacrosse. Nothing stuck, and never did I feel the sense of shared purpose and team spirit that I had felt up in Maine. So I went off to college with a very narrowed sense of what I was good at. So you may know that one thing I do at Brooks is to promote the sport of rowing. I do so because someone once sold it to me, and it forever changed my life, mostly for the better. I was walking across the freshman campus during the early days of college orientation, and was drawn to a group of students who were standing around these very long, skinny boats. One of the rowers waved, over, waved me over, clearly impressed by my 138-pound frame unencumbered by muscle. I, tried, I decided to give it a try. I had heard about the sport through a cousin. I liked being on the water, but frankly, I was looking for something to do. In the fall of that first year, it felt like an episode of Survivor, which I've just started, without the TV drama, there were 120 that went to the information session. By the end of the first week, there were 60. We were learning to row in wooden eights built in the 60s and 70s on this swamp known as the lagoon. We ran the three miles to and from campus each day. When there were still too many of us, numbers were reduced through these physical tests. It was the closest I ever got to a military boot camp. So I made the freshman team that year, and for the remainder of my college life, everything and I mean everything, everything I did was in some way connected to the rowing team. I was fortunate in my timing. We were fast. 
And for those four years, rowing was my ticket to see the world. I raced across the United States, in Europe, and even in Cuba when Castro was still in power. It was this sport that ultimately led me to my first career in finance. It led me to find my wife, Kathy, and ultimately it was this that led me into a second career working with young people. So rowing today remains to this day the pillar in my life off of which everything else seems to hang. I've heard from many friends and colleagues here and elsewhere their version of how athletics channeled their life's pursuits. So here I'm going to leave the comfort of the sport that chose me and talk more generally about my belief in athletics for you, for me, and for our school. So I want you all to rewind a few months, go back to the first day at Brooks, sitting in another awesome orientation group with a bunch of people you just met. When asked to say a few things about yourself, many of you would say something about your chosen sport. My name is Jeremy, I play hockey. My name is Will, I play squash. Why is our sport the first thing that comes out of our mouth when we're told to identify who we are? I imagine one reason is that you associate sport with development and growth as a child. From the U13s to the U15s, from the mites, tell me if I got this wrong, to the squirts, to the bantams. From the town team to the travel team. There are a few other times in your lives thus far because you haven't had children, you haven't had jobs. There are a few other times when you get such clear cut milestones in your life. Also, it just doesn't quite sound right. Hey, I'm Jeremy. Like, I write a good three paragraph essay and I'm good at alliteration. Or, yeah, I'm Caroline. Uh, I just mastered the Pythagorean theorem and if things go well for me, I might be doing a little Soka Toa this spring. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Another reason is that we, I, I think when we identify through our sport, we do something that we humans crave which is that we are part of something that is vastly bigger than we are. And I think it's also through our pursuits that we are encouraged and expected to be the very best we can be. I know that humans want to be the best we can be. I see students holding back in the classrooms, maybe for social reasons. I have never once seen a student hold back on the water, on the courts, or on the fields of my coaching. And the last, and pursuant to one of these quotes, uh, readings today, I think athletics gives us what Jack London meant, a time when we feel most alive. Oxygen and other molecules are like pumping through every cell in your body. There is danger, there is risk, you're on edge. I think it's proven that we form some of the most lasting memories in our lives during those moments. So if I were to ask you right now to just quickly close your eyes and tell you that I want you to think of a time when you were like eight years old, my guess is that many of you would think of some tryout, some buzzer beater shot that you scored, some personal best. So athletics, I think, is, you can open your eyes, athletics, I think, is important to you, and it should be. You've all heard it from Captain Zeb today. You've all heard it. Exercise is essential to physical and mental health. Developing a lifelong athletic uh, passion, I believe, is going to lengthen your life and brighten it. I think it allows us to learn the healthy side of competition, and when I say healthy, I mean appreciating that word for its definition. Competition means striving together. It is important that you try as hard as you can. That's what it means. You're supposed to try to win. That's the expectation, but when it's over, it's over. You shake hands, and that's that. I also think the crossover into academics is absolutely incredible. During the fall, when Timmy was making up some problems to prepare for a pre-cal test, he would always do one more, I noticed, just to make sure that he had it. And there were a few weeks later, I had fitness room duty on a Sunday, and I had a bird's eye view on a Sunday late morning of Timmy doing solo practice on the court draining foul shot after foul shot after foul shot, and I actually started videoing it to see how many in a row he could do. And then he moved out to the three-point line, and he started to miss. Occasionally, Tim, occasionally. But when he did, he would go back to that spot on the three-point line, and that's what he would practice again and again and again until he nailed it. And I thought to myself, boy, those lessons from math sure are carrying over into basketball. 
I don't think so. I first taught Kendall her freshman year. It was a bumpy road, Kendall. <laughs> Many days she would walk out of class just shaking her head, and I would hear what, she didn't think I heard what she was saying. She'd say things like, I don't even know what I don't know. <laughs> or, I never learned this as she walked out. Or my favorite, this class is killing me. And yet she'd walk back in the next day, head held high and ready to go. And so it is incredible, Kendall, for me to see how far you've come as a student and you don't get that sort of resilience from a textbook. I could go on all day about individuals that I've seen convert themselves academically through their experience in, in uh, athletics. There's another thing that I think is very true that we don't talk about much, but we should, which is that there is no better signal to your future, to your future employers, than athletic commitment. When I worked in finance, which I did for 12 years before seeing the light, our firm would receive a large stack of resumes from each of the colleges that we, where we interviewed. And this, the stack was like this tall. A first task was to cull this thing down to a pile of like 10 or 20 whom we would then go and interview. One of the funnier partners at our firm suggested that we randomly select one out of every 10 and we go and interview them on the grounds that he didn't want, he only wanted lucky people working for our firm, okay? But we didn't do that. But what we did do was follow the general consensus among the people who had worked there a long time which was to first sort according to commitment and evidence of teamwork. Coursework was important, GPA was important, those were necessary, but they were not sufficient. Simply put, the firm I was working for wanted to hire athletes. I was also just reading about one of a new, uh, these new private equity firms in Boston who will only finance entrepreneurs that come from a certain sport because of the implied characteristics of its participants. And they listed them. Leadership, grace under pressure, endurance, courage, and commitment. So it isn't your slap shot. It isn't your batting average or your 15 second pin or your 2,000 meter time that matter. It is what they say about who you are. I think it's important to realize that most of the world is not like us. We infuse academics and athletics into a co-curriculum. Our roots lie in the old English boarding schools, and while we've get, gotten rid of a lot of their traditions, like wearing three-piece suits to class and limiting enrollment to boys, we have held on to this very, very strong tradition of combining academics and athletics. Even in, in the United States, the university system combines the two. In most parts of the world, you need to choose either an academic path or an athletic path, one of the two. So why do we do it? I've been thinking about this. There is a practical issue, and I speak as one of the dorm parents over in Thorne. I cannot imagine living in Thorne House if it weren't for athletics. My sanity depends on their daily release of energy outside. But there's some less obvious ones too. I think one that I've noticed here is that our athletic program gives you all an opportunity to compete, which you need as humans, and you do it outside of the classrooms. As soon as I got to Brooks seven years ago, I noticed the very first time I got here how good you are at forming classes. And the way that you come together in the classroom is not competitive. If it is competitive, it is truly striving together. And as I learned in my winter term this year, where I had a lot of a certain uh, team, if they are going to team up on anybody, it's gonna be against the teacher. Thank you, girls hockey team. That was an awesome three weeks. Athletics gives us a regular opportunity, I think, also to celebrate excellence. As many times as I've asked Mr. Packard to announce Jerry's most recent AP stats test grade, it just doesn't seem to make the cut. Athletics is, part, is also perhaps the most enduring connection our alums feel with our school. When they come back, even driving through the night for a New England final, they want to see their team play and they want to see us win. It's the same game, the same rules, the same field that they were on. And so at a time when everything else about our school and our world seems to be changing so fast, athletics seems to be the one constant that connects our alums back to the school. 
It seems really important to the outside world. Just ask our admissions team, ask the college counseling team, ask our communications team. People out there really care about that part of our school. And lastly and more personally, I think combining athletics and academics is good for us all. I know it's good for me. I think it makes us more effective in our jobs. I've learned more about being a good teacher when I've been a coach in the afternoon, and I've definitely become a better coach through my teaching. For recent proof, look no further than my good friend Alexandria Sacco, whose evolution into a great teacher and one of the best school people we have began as a counselor and a soccer coach. Other programs, including one that I'm very close with, are now competing for her time, energy, and ability to connect meaningfully with students. So you might ask about why I'm speaking about this today. Yes, our spring season began yesterday, and I am thinking about the spring ahead. And yes, I was betting on some good results yesterday, so we're thinking about athletics and celebrating them. I've also, for the first time in 20 years, not coached in the winter, which has been a real boon for me. I've been able to go around and watch hockey and basketball and wrestling and squash and all the things that happen here in the winter. But also, I think that we need to be careful not to take our athletic tradition for granted. Remembering how important it is for us as a school and for the future lives of our students. It takes us all, athletes, coaches, parents, teachers, administrators to understand, believe, and invest in that model. And I do feel we're at risk. I feel we're under threat. I think we're threatened by the belief that young people and older people should only participate in things that they're really good at already. I think we're threatened by the growing influence of private clubs that pull our community off campus, make us feel less like strong junior high school and more like my high school, and I think we're threatened occasionally by the influence of money jeopardizing the purity of athletic competition. So I will end you now with a sentiment of tremendous gratitude about this life I am allowed to call a job. I'm grateful to Bobby and to Doug Burbank for giving me a glimpse into this life of an independent school educator 25 years ago, to my wife Kathy and my wife and Brooks alumna Kathy for joining me in this adventure, and mostly to the inspiration that I've drawn from hundreds of students I've taught, athletes I've coached, and the colleagues joining me in this wonderful profession. Thank you.